just check when, how long have they got till? So about half past one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, can I just say uh, thank you very much for inviting me here today. It's lovely uh, to be here. It's been very inspiring actually listening to uh, some of the talks over the last couple of days. Um, it's really nice to see that uh, the science of experimental psychopathology is alive and kicking despite attempts to strangulate it by funding agencies as I've experienced. Um, and uh, I find it really quite inspiring actually. But I also love Italy. It's my probably my favourite country in the world. So any excuse to visit here actually frankly <laughs> I would come anyway. But it's been a really good meeting. So um, So uh, the topic of my talk today is uh, the social risk factors to psychotic symptoms. And I should just say a little bit about how I've come to be interested in this area. Um, I, I think I was described as an expert clinician a second ago, which I certainly don't actually feel that I'm an expert clinician. Uh, I think to be an expert clinician, you actually have to practice day after day after day. And uh, I'm called so far up the ivory tower in the last few years that I certainly don't feel as skilled as many of my colleagues in the uh, National Health Service in Britain. Uh, but what I have felt is that our ability to help people with the most severe forms of psychiatric disorder, the psychoses, um, will depend ultimately on our ability to understand the causes and mechanisms involved in these conditions. And that's what I've devoted most of the last 30 years to actually. Um, and I started off with uh, some scepticism about the concept of schizophrenia, which I maintain. We've heard a lot over the last couple of days about problems with uh, DSM-type categorical diagnosis and the importance of developing new approaches such as network models, which I'm very enthusiastic about. Um, uh, so uh, I've always been sceptical about the biomedical sort of story about schizophrenia. Uh, but recently I've become increasingly interested in social determinants of psychosis. Um, and I would have never predicted 15 years ago that my research would have led in this direction. Uh, it actually led, it came, it moved in this direction as a result of writing a book called Madness Explained, which is published about 10 years ago, which I'm just in the process of out, updating. And um, I, while I wrote this book, I thought I needed to write a chapter on social factors, and I thought it would be very short and to my surprise I discovered an emerging uh, rich data set of evidence about social factors and this made me to think uh, very deeply about, at least I hope it's deeply, about uh, the determinants of severe mental illness uh, and it's led me to question actually some of the things which we do as psychologists and psychiatrists which I will come to uh, at the end. So, I want to start with, uh, I'm going to talk about schizophrenia as if it's a thing. Okay, it's not a thing, it's a hodgepodge of different symptoms which are not particularly connected to each other other than in the kind of network way which we've heard about. And I'll say a little bit more about the individual symptoms later on, but just for the sake of argument, just putting that aside, I'm going to talk about schizophrenia as if it is a thing to begin with. Um, and this thing we are told in psychiatric textbooks, or at least I've been told, is largely a genetic disorder. And uh, one of the things I want to do for a start off is just address a common misconception about the genetics of uh, mental illness. I've become very interested in the genetics of mental illness lately and have actually spent quite a lot of time talking to geneticists. So I feel I've sort of become sort of fairly kind of reasonably versed in the area. And it seems to me that there are some very profound misunderstandings of the genetic data. And one of the really interesting things about modern genetics is it's pointing to a very different conception of mental illness than those you will find in the textbooks. So throughout the history of uh, psychiatry, the idea that schizophrenia is a genetic con condition has been regarded as an axiom rather than a hypothesis, an assumption which our research will inevitably support rather than an idea which is to be tested against the data. 
And there are many examples of this, but just one, just a, a lovely story, which, well, it's a sad story actually, which illustrates this idea, is a program of research conducted in the 1970s and 1980s in the United States by uh, Rosenthal, who was a psychologist, um, on four ladies, four unfortunate ladies who are genetically identical, or alleged to be genetically identical, they didn't have DNA testing in those days, uh, and um, who were concordant for schizophrenia. And the discovery of four genetically identical women who were concordant for schizophrenia was considered to be, in and of itself, evidence that schizophrenia is a genetic disorder. And you can see where the researchers were coming from, because these uh, ladies were referred to as the Janine quadruplets, with Janine being a pseudonym, obviously to preserve their, uh, their identity, and they were given pseudo-first names of Nora, Ira, Mara and Hester. And Janine actually means, it's derived from Greek, dreadful gene. So these are the ladies with the dreadful gene. And Nora, Ira, Mara and Hester, rather conveniently spelled National Institute of Mental Health. Now, there are many things which I could say about this study, which was deeply flawed from conception to end. But I just want to point out one thing at this stage. This is uh, some quotes which the researchers made about these ladies in passing. It was just noted in the papers that they wrote. Uh, so they're talking about the father who was described as a paranoid alcoholic, and it said he chose Nora as his favourite at times, fondling her breasts and being intrusive when she was in the bathroom. And then he goes on to say, Iris and Hester engaged in mutual masturbation. The parents, horrified, agreed with an attending physician to have both girls circumcised and their hands tied to their beds for 30 nights. This wasn't in the dark ages, this is in the 1960s. Nora and Mara were not allowed to visit their sisters and couldn't understand the whole situation. Of course they couldn't. Now, I put it to you that this is not evidence of benign childhood. Almost certainly, reading between the lines, and actually you don't have to read very far between the lines, father sexually abused these ladies. Uh, but this was never considered as a possible cause of their psychiatric difficulties by the researchers, who assumed throughout that they were suffering from the dreadful gene. Um, and this kind of assumption still exists today. This is a website from the Schizophrenia Research Institute here in Australia. It's about three years old. They've actually taken it down because I and a number of people uh, asked them to take it down because it's highly misleading. Um, so this is a major research institute in Australia and it provides this page of key facts, or it provided this page of key facts for patients and their families. This is not for professionals, this is for ordinary people to read. And among the key facts it says, there are genetic factors involved. For example, a child of a parent with schizophrenia has a 10% greater chance than other children of developing the illness. Estimated heritability is 80%. That is, genetic factors contribute 80% to the causes of schizophrenia. Now, this is so mistaken, it isn't even wrong. So, for a start, uh, the first sentence actually underestimates the genetic risk. Because it's not a 10% increased chance, it's actually a 10% chance, which isn't the same thing. But the most egregious thing is this repetition of something which has been said in psychiatric textbooks, and which I heard a leading internationally respected psychiatric geneticist repeat in the, within the last two years. 80% of heritability means that 80% of the cause is genetic. And that is just a profound misunderstanding of what heritability means. So just in case there's any mistakes about this, just let's look at this heritability concept. Basically, the thing you need to know about heritability is it's a partial correlation coefficient. And you will remember what you were taught in Statistics 101 about correlations. Correlations do not necessarily mean causality. So it's constructed, or has been thought of, as a sort of genes-to-environment ratio. So basically, there are different ways of calculating. There's a very simple method from twin studies called the Falkland method, which you can do on the back of an envelope. The more advanced methods give you almost the same results. So you've got the variance associated with genes decided by, divided by the variance associated with genes plus the variance associated with the environment. <coughs> And the first point to make is it's not a statement about people at all, it's a statement about populations. And the second point to make is it, it assumes an additive model that you can simply separate, you can pass out the effect of genes and the effect of the environment and then add them together. Everything we know about genetics at the molecular level now tells us that this is, us that this is not true. 
You cannot just add genes and environment and get to 100%. It doesn't work like that. Because it's a statement about populations, heritability estimates depend upon the population. So imagine a situation where everybody smokes exactly 20 cigarettes a day. Some people smoke, nobody smokes 10 cigarettes, nobody smokes 30 cigarettes, everybody smokes exactly 20 cigarettes. In such a population, the variance in lung cancer would be entirely attributable to genetic risk because everybody's exposed to the same environment. So the heritability, calculated in this way, of lung cancer would be close to 100%. But what would be the cause of lung cancer? Well, obviously, in some sense, it is genetic. But what would be the cause which you'd want to deal with? If, say, you wanted to eradicate lung cancer, it would be smoking. So here we would have a situation where you've got 100% heritability, but the major cause is environmental. Now, you might think that this is a silly thought experiment, but actually there are some real examples of this sort. Uh, so IQ, for example, I was taught when I was a student, is about 70% heritable. Uh, and it is at about 70% heritable in middle class families. In working class families, a different population, the heritability falls to somewhere between 0 and 30%, depending on which studies you look at. Why is this? Well, actually, nobody really knows, and there's quite an intensive debate in the area. But one possibility is that middle class families are boring. All middle class families do the same. They tell their kids to do their homework. They extol the virtues of a university education. They make them read books, and so on. Whereas working class families are very variable. Some working class families do encourage kids to excel at education, and some, frankly, discourage people. Certainly in, in my country, some working class families discourage their children from doing well at school, mainly because the parents themselves have had a bad experience of school. So there's much more variation in working class families, which reduces the heritability estimate. Heritability estimates also don't take into account gene-environment interactions. These are, in principle, highly complex, and some of them are probably undetectable without sample sizes going into the millions. Um, but, I mean, there are all sorts of different ways in which they can happen. They're probably ubiquitous, actually. There's probably everything involves gene-environment interactions. But, you know, you can think of some very simple examples. So what would, it be, what would the world be like if um, there was a gene which made you crave nicotine? Well, is that a gene for cigarette smoking or is it a gene for lung cancer? It would look like a gene for lung cancer, the way that we normally calculate these things. But if you move to a society in which cigarettes weren't available, you wouldn't get lung cancer. So gene-environment interactions themselves have complex implications, but for heritability estimates... One implication is that you can again have very high estimates of heritability and still major environmental causes. Uh, two uh, researchers, Dickens and Flynn, Flynn's a famous researcher on IQ, actually produced quite a dense mathematical treatment of this, and they showed that you could have heritability estimates close to 100%, but still major environmental determinants if there were uh, large gene times environment interactions. So. What have we discovered from uh, psychiatric genetics? We've actually discovered some interesting things. Um, and so I can only sort of mention a couple of highlights, but they're very important in current context. This is a study by, uh, uh, from the Karolinska Institute uh, by Lichtenstein and others. Uh, they've produced a fantastic series of papers on population studies of severe mental illness. Um, in this particular study, the population is the entire population of Sweden. Uh, which uh, consists of 2 million families uh, with 9 million participants whose medical records were traced and analysed. Um, and what they looked at was the risk of schizophrenia and the risk of bipolar disorder in the first degree relatives of people who had schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Now, you would expect that first degree relatives of people with schizophrenia would have an increased risk of schizophrenia, and indeed they did. And also you'd expect the first degree relatives of patients with bipolar disorder to have an increased risk of bipolar disorder, and in Greek, D, they did. But they also found that the first degree relatives of schizophrenia patients had an increased risk of bipolar disorder, and the first degree relatives of bipolar patients had an increased risk of schizophrenia. In other words, the genetic risk did not run true to families. Uh, it wasn't diagnostically specific, sorry. 
And there are actually quite a few other studies which show this now. There's actually a, a meta-analysis which was published in the last year which showed that in samples of schizophrenia patients there was a high risk of not only schizophrenia, this is in first degree relatives, not only schizophrenia, but also bipolar disorder and major depression. There's even a study from the World Mental Health Surveys, which doesn't unfortunately include psychosis, but was published in the British Journal of Psychiatry a few years ago, which tried to find out, by not particularly adequate methods actually, but they tried to look at the diagnosis of about 20,000 people in 18 countries, and also the diagnosis, if any, of their patients. And the bottom line was this actually, it was having a parent with a psychiatric disorder, any psychiatric disorder, increased the risk of having a psychiatric disorder any psychiatric disorder. So at the family level, from these kind of family studies, there's no evidence that, that genetic risk is diagnostically specific. And that is pretty much what we find at the molecular level. There's been some fantastic progress in molecular genetics over the last few years, uh, mainly on the back of GWAS studies, very large uh, genome-wide association studies. Um, and the bottom line is this, really. There are no genes of major effect for schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Instead, what it looks like is that the risk of both is massively polygenic. In other words, there are hundreds of genes, some estimates say above 1,000, each which confer a tiny increased risk of disorder. And most of these genes are not specific to any one disorder. They increase the risk of schizophrenia. Actually, there's some genetic commonality between schizophrenia, major depression, bipolar disorder, autism and intellectual disability in the latest studies. Um, so um, one of the things you can do with this is calculate something called a polygenic risk score. So you basically, it, it's, it, there's a bit of sort of, I, I won't go into details because it's, it, there's a slight complication about how you do this, but basically you estimate, you find genes which might be linked to, say, schizophrenia. Uh, you don't know entirely because there's problems in significance testing with large GRS studies. But you can add up, if you've got sus suspect genes, and there are several hundreds which are, are strongly suspected as being involved, you can simply add up in any one individual the number of affected alleles, and that gives you a single score, the polygenic risk score. Um, this is uh, data on polygenic risk scores in the 10 centiles uh, for uh, three large uh, studies. And you can see as polygenic risk increases towards the right, then the actual risk of a diagnosis uh, increases. But the essential point is there isn't two groups there. It's just that people vary in the amount of risk. And recently, Kenneth Kendler has said, he's a well-known American psychiatrist, biological psychiatrist, he's, he's argued that the genetic risk for schizophrenia is widely distributed in human populations, so we all carry the risk to some degree. If there are 100 genes, say, linked to schizophrenia, and I say there's likely to be more, most of you in this room will have 50, say, of the at-risk alleles. But if one or two fortunate people, perhaps, who've got very few, and there'll be one or two unfortunate people who've got most of them. But all of you will carry some risk to some degree. And that's a very different picture of genetic risk than one which we're used to in the psychiatric textbooks. So there is a genetic risk, but it's very non-specific. What about social risk factors? Well, it turns out there are many. Uh, they turn out to include urban environments, uh, poverty, especially in childhood, inequality, which is not the same as poverty. I'll come on to this in a second. Migration. Uh, something called parental communication deviance, the way that parents communicate with their children. Separation from parents at an early age, childhood sexual and physical abuse, and bullying by peers are all known to be risk factors to psychosis. And in most cases, there are good meta-analyses which support these risk factors from a lot of studies. Just mention a few of these in, in kind of detail. Urbanicity. Uh, WHO reported about two years ago that for the first time in human history, 50% of the world's population now lives in cities. And the projections are that this is going to increase in the coming 100 years. So we're going to become a species of city dwellers. 
The first study to really look at the relationship between urbanicity and severe mental illness uh, was by Farris and Dunham in their famous study of Chicago uh, before the Second World War. Um, and what they found is shown in this picture um, from their research as a map of Chicago and the darker areas are the areas which have a high density of schizophrenia patients. And basically, um, it's uh, the risk of schizophrenia increased was increased in the poor urban centres. And as you got out to the affluent suburbs, the risk decreased. Now, there's been a protracted argument for about, well, 50 or 60 years about what this means. And one interpretation is it's due to what's called downward social drift. So the idea here is that if you have schizophrenia, that you become poor because you can't afford to work. So you have to go and live where accommodation is cheap, and that's in the sort of unpleasant downtown neighbourhoods. Uh, but we now know it's unlikely that social drift accounts for this effect, again from large studies carried out in Scandinavia. So about 10 years ago, there's a study by Pedersen and Mortensen, which looked at 2 million uh, Danish uh, citizens, and they were able to trace their addresses when they lived in, during childhood. And they found that um, there was a dose-response relationship between exposure to inner-city environments in childhood and risk of schizophrenia in adulthood. Um, and those response relationships are important because they, they give some indication there might be causal process involved. I'll come back to this point later on. Um, but um, they also found, interestingly enough, that the more often children moved in childhood, the more likely they were to be, become psychotic in adulthood. Um, there's also some recent studies from Israel which suggest that there's an interaction with cognitive functioning, that people who have high cognitive function are less affected by the urbanicity effect. But the urbanicity effect has been well replicated, and it seems to be something about cities in childhood. Poverty and social disadvantage have also been linked to um, uh, risk of psychosis in adulthood. There are a number of really good studies of this, but I'd highlight the work of Wicks. Um, Wicks has carried out uh, a really uh, fascinating genetically informed study, uh, which looked at, uh, it was an adoption study, again it used the big Swedish data set. What the, the general finding was that there was both a main effect for social disadvantage in childhood and also an interaction with genetic risk. So, Poverty in childhood increased the risk of psychosis across the board, but the effect was greater if people had uh, a, gen uh, a putative genetic risk uh, of psychosis. <laughs> <laughs>